Okay guys, in this video we're going to be talking about Hess's Law. Uh, Hess's Law states that the enthalpy change for a sequence of reaction steps is equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes for the individual steps. Uh, ultimately, this is due to the fact that enthalpy is a state function, and so the uh, enthalpy change for uh, an overall process does not depend upon uh, the path taken. Uh, in this uh, example here, uh, we're imagine going from the reactants A and B to the products E and F through this intermediate step uh, involving C and D. And so Hess's law tells us that the overall enthalpy change is equal to the enthalpy change of the two steps involved. And so we imagine that the first step involves this delta H1, the second step involves this delta H2, and then if you add these two chemical equations together, so that is if we take everything that's on the left-hand side, that's A plus B plus C plus D, and make that your reactants, and then you take everything that's on the product side, C plus D plus E plus F, you'll notice that the C plus D on the reactant side cancels with the C plus D on the product side, giving us the overall reaction. Uh, you do the exact same thing to the delta H values. That is, you take delta H1 plus delta H2, and that's the delta H for the overall reaction. Okay, so let's illustrate... Uh, Let's illustrate Hess's law using a more practical example. So suppose that you are interested in the um, partial combustion of carbon graphite to carbon monoxide. And you want to know the, what is the enthalpy of reaction for this reaction. The trouble is, is that uh, when, you, when you go to combust graphite, you're not going to get only carbon monoxide, you're always going to get some carbon dioxide produced. Uh, and so it's difficult to study this reaction experimentally, at least directly. Uh, however, if you, um, if you do a complete combustion of graphite, which is possible, uh, you'll produce exclusively CO2. And the delta H value for that reaction is known. Uh, also, if you take a sample of pure carbon dioxide, so if you purify the carbon dioxide and then combust that completely, you'll also get CO2, and the delta H for that reaction is known. And so the idea of Hess's law is to take these two equi thermochemical equations, whose delta H values are known, and combine them in such a way that you will get uh, the unknown reaction and be able to calculate the unknown delta H. And so I do these types of problems by, by inspection, uh, and, and let me illustrate how that works. So the idea is you want to build the unknown reaction from the known reactions. And so start with, start with the first reactant in the, um, in the unknown equation. And so here, this represents uh, this chemical reaction one that I'm trying to build. And so I look, I, I need graphite. In fact, I need two moles of graphite on the reactant side. And so I'll look at my known reactions to see where is graphite. So we see that graphite is here in reaction two. Okay, it's on the reactant side, which is what I want. Uh, but we'll notice that the stoichiometric coefficient here is one, whereas I want a two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take reaction 2 and I'm going to multiply it by a factor of 2. So chemical equation 2, I'm going to multiply by 2. That's going to give me the graphite in the right place with the right stoichiometric coefficient. Then I move on to my next species, which is oxygen. And oxygen is kind of a tricky one because you see that it appears in both thermochemical equations. When you see that, skip over the species. So we're going to skip oxygen and move on to the product, carbon monoxide. Okay, we want two moles of carbon monoxide in the products, and so we go and we look at our known thermochemical equations and try to find the carbon monoxide. And we find it here on the reactant side, okay, but we want it on the product side, and we want two moles. We've got two moles on the reactant side here, but we want them in the products. 
So what you want to do is to take thermochemical equation 3 and you want to reverse it. So you're going to multiply by negative 1. So we're going to take minus reaction 3. Okay? And now what I'll show you is that if you perform these operations on the known chemical equations, indeed it will produce the unknown chemical equation. So I'm going to take 2 times reaction 2. So this 2 times reaction 2 is carbon graphite times 2 plus 2 times oxygen gas and that's going to give you 2 CO2 gas. Now if you take minus reaction 3, okay, that's going to put the 2 CO2 on the product side and then we're going to have um, the two carbon monoxides and then uh, the oxygen on the product side. Okay, now I'm going to combine these together. So I'm going to be adding these up. So I've got two carbon graphite plus two O2 gas plus two CO2 gas. So essentially everything that's on the reactant side I've combined into one reactants and I'll do the same thing for the products. We've got two CO2 gas plus two carbon monoxide gas plus an oxygen gas. And so now what we'll look at is, is what can cancel. We see that we've got two CO2s on each side of the reaction. So those cancel out. Uh, we've also got two oxygens over here and one oxygen over here, so we can cancel this one, and that's just going to give us a one. And so now we've got two carbon graphite plus O2 gas gives us two carbon monoxide. And indeed, this is reaction one. Okay. Now, if we carry out the same operation on the delta H values, that is, the delta H for reaction 1 is 2 times the delta H for reaction 2 minus the delta H for reaction 3. Uh, we get this result. And I'm just going to check the numbers, make sure I didn't make a mistake on the slide. I think there's a slight error uh, in the numerical part of the calculation. Uh, the answer should be minus 219 kilojoules. So I, I messed up the, the, the digits here. It should be minus 219 kilojoules. But, but anyway, the, the, the procedure works. That is, you, you perform the same calculation on the delta H values that you did on the chemical equations. Uh, let's do a, a problem like this from scratch. So here we have um, the reaction of sulfur and oxygen to produce sulfur trioxide. Uh, we want to calculate the enthalpy of reaction for this reaction. And we're given uh, these two reactions here, one involving sulfur and oxygen to produce SO2, and then the decomposition of sulfur trioxide to sulfur dioxide and oxygen. So I'm going to call these reactions 1, 2, and 3. So uh, the reaction we're trying to find uh, is going to be reaction 1. Uh, so that's 2S plus 3O2 gas to 2SO3 gas. And reaction 2 will be the S the sulfur plus the oxygen to give us SO2 gas. And then reaction three will be the decomposition reaction like that. And so we are trying to find reaction one. And we want two sulfurs on the reactant side Reaction 2 has sulfur on the reactant side, but the stoichiometric coefficient is 1. So I'm going to say that reaction 1 is going to be 2 times reaction 2. That's going to give us the correct sulfur. Uh, we see that the oxygen appears in both reactions 2 and 3, and so I'm not going to deal with that. 
I'm going to focus on the SO3. Uh, we've got SO3 on the products. We need two of them. We see that we've got SO3 on the reactant side here. There is two of them, but we need to reverse the reaction. So we're going to make this minus reaction 3. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show that this combination of these chemical equations does in fact give you chemical equation 1. Uh, I'm simply going to calculate the delta H for reaction 1. It's going to be 2 times the delta H for reaction 2 minus the delta H for reaction 3. So that's minus 297 minus 198. So I'm getting minus 792 kilojoules out of this calculation. So that's the delta H value for the unknown, uh, for the unknown reaction. Now let's do another one. This one's uh, more complicated. It has more, more equations. <clears throat> so we're trying to, um, to find the enthalpy uh, for the reaction where tungsten carbide is formed. And we have these three, uh, these three thermochemical equations here. So I'm going to call this reaction one at the top. This will be reaction two, three, and four. Uh, I'm not going to write them down. Uh, just know that we've numbered them in that fashion. So it's one, two, three, and four. So we want to build reaction one. Okay. We want tungsten, one mole of tungsten on the reactant side. We see that we've got two moles of tungsten on the reaction side in reaction two. And so what we need to do then is multiply by one half times reaction two. Then we'll take a look at the next species, graphite. We find graphite in reaction three. It is on the reactant side and it has the same stoichiometric coefficient. So we're just going to add in reaction three. And that's going to give us the graphite where we want it. Then uh, moving over to the last species, the tungsten carbide, uh, we want one mole of tungsten carbide on the products. We see that this reaction four contains the tungsten carbide. However, it's on the wrong side. So we at least want to multiply this reaction by minus one to put the tungsten carbide on the product side. Also though, we only want one mole of tungsten carbide. So we need to get rid of that factor of two so we're going to multiply by minus one half times reaction four. Now I'm going to leave it again as an exercise for you to show that this combination of these chemical equations will in fact give you uh, this unknown chemical equation. Uh, what I'll do is I'll calculate the delta H. So the delta H for reaction one is going to be one half the delta H for reaction two plus the delta H for reaction three, minus one half the delta H for reaction four. So one half times this minus 1685.8 plus minus 393.5 minus one half times the negative 2391.8. Okay, let me run this through our calculator. And I'm getting minus 40.5 kilojoules out of that calculation. So this is how you apply uh, Hess's law. Uh, I do it by inspection. You want to build the unknown reaction in terms of the known reactions. Once you get that formula, which you can always check, you then apply the same formula to the delta H values to get the answer. I'll, uh, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and leave this, this one as an exercise for you to try. Uh, for fun though, I wanted to do the, um, the next one, this last one involving phase transitions. 
um, just because it's worded a little differently. Uh, here we're given the enthalpy changes for several phase transitions of water. Here we have uh, the melting of ice going from solid ice to liquid water. Uh, that process, its technical name, is called fusion. So the word fusion uh, is sometimes a misnomer. People mistake it to mean freezing, but it actually means melting. Um, the enthalpy change for this process is called the enthalpy of fusion. Uh, here we have uh, the vaporization of liquid water, so boiling, going from liquid to gas. And then in this last phase change, it's called sublimation. You're going from ice directly to water vapor without passing through the liquid phase. Uh, and that's called the enthalpy of sublimation. And so the question is, how are these changes related? And then what I'll point out is that the entire scheme can be written like this. You can start off in the solid, go to the liquid. Okay, so this is the fusion. And then you can go, uh, you can go through the vaporization. Notice that the overall process is sublimation. Okay, so if this is the delta H of um, a fusion, and this is the delta H of vaporization, the overall process is the delta H of sublimation. And according to Hess's law, the enthalpy of sublimation would then be the enthalpy of fusion plus the enthalpy of, of vaporization. So the different enthalpy changes are related like this. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here. And in the next one, we're going to talk about standard states, and, and we're going to do some more calculations involving thermochemical equations.